activity. Uh, um, did so from 1974 when Sabina Kartins had finished her training in Leipzig and got a job in, in television uh, headquarters in Adlershof. Then that became the Kartins Group and Fritz Dirtl was central to the setting up of the Kartins Group and it functioned as a semi-autonomous group within television. Um, so we basically no one interfered with what we were doing um, or told us what to do. We had virtually complete freedom. I mean, there were the odd films which, like I mentioned, the Was Denk der Bundesburger, where battles took place at a higher political level about whether we could show this or whether we can't show this. But in essence, most of the films went, went through without, without a problem. Well, all, all the teams came together. Uh, we would meet usually in a, in a Western country uh, over a weekend. Um, where we'd show some of the films that had been made and shown, um, and we would discuss these, criticize them, self-criticize them, um, say what we didn't like, had they been edited as we wanted them to be, um, were they effective, weren't they effective? So there's a discussion of the previous work, and then that fed into a discussion of future plans and how we could improve our filmmaking. I mean, it was always a question of how can we get better? How can, how can, we, how can we deal with this problem? Oh, totally free discussion, yeah. We, I mean, we, we, we were all, in that sense, we were all on an equal level. Nobody was the boss, nobody was saying, this is the way the discussion was. It was a, it was a free discussion, and it was, it was done on a com very comradely basis. And we didn't have any, any serious um, problems or conflicts. Um, you know, sometimes, one of us would be severely criticised for, for one of the films we'd made or that it was badly shot or, or we hadn't done the interview properly or, or we hadn't put the right questions, but, but that, was, that was quite rare. Um, but, but I mean, as I say, we had this continuous self-evaluation of our work, which was absolutely essential because the, the, the central problem, as, as you will be aware, of making the films we did, although we, have, we had a clear plan what we wanted to do, who we wanted to interview, where we wanted to, to shoot. Um, documentary films are not like feature films that you can have a script and plan it from start to finish. You know, you, as I mentioned earlier in, about Portugal, you have to react to what's happening on the street and you think, oh, that's an idea, we should follow that up or we shouldn't follow that up. Can we follow that up? Where will it go? Our, our big problem is that although we were in charge of all the filming, and we, and we had a clear plan of what we wanted to do, and we, we, we wrote a script of the way we thought the film should be edited, what should be put together, the significance of what we'd shot for the film. But in the end, it was edited by the Cartins group in Adlershof. And on <coughs> several occasions we, we were there and could help with the editing, but most occasions we weren't because we were out filming. So we had to rely on them to edit as we as we felt it should be edited, in the way we wanted it to be edited, but we were still very much reliant on the editors in Berlin. Um, but most of the time, we were, we were satisfied with what they did with our material. Not entirely, not certainly not 100%, as one never would be. You know, I would have edited the film in a different way, as I'm sure my colleagues would say the same. But we didn't feel that uh, images or what we were trying to say was being distorted or misappropriated, misused, otherwise we wouldn't have continued working. Um, we felt that the essence of what we wanted to say was, was there in the finished film, in the edited film. Exactly, it was, it was, it was a bit of a, an odd situation that, that you, know, you, you made a film and you knew exactly what you wanted to do with that material, but someone else was putting it together. And it was difficult communication because, again, we have to think this was before the internet or anything else and we couldn't have direct contact with the GDR because we weren't supposed to be part of the GDR. Um, so we, it involved a lot of writing. You know, we, as I say, we had, to, we had to write up all the interviews, had to be done into German, many of them first translated, then into German. Uh, then we had to do a film list of what we'd shot and the significance of these shots and then a suggested editing script so it was, it was a lot of work and they could either accept that or not accept it but at least it gave them an idea they knew what we wanted to do what we wanted to put across 
this was a problem that uh, people in the GDR were unable to imagine the situation in these countries for obvious reasons. If you've never been there, you can't imagine how, how bad it was or how difficult it was. And Western reporters could always, as they do in, 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 in war situations, you know, they crouch down and say, I'm being bombed, but I'm managing to continue filming and so forth. Or I'm here with this man here and I'm having to talk quite quietly because otherwise we'll be arrested by the policeman waiting outside the door. You know, that, that gives a, a, makes it dramatic. And we, we couldn't do that. I mean, the fact that we were filming in South Africa and talking to black people, okay, we were filming and talking to black people. What's, what's special about that? But it was very special in a sense because you know we were filming illegally and and what have you yeah so yes that was that was that was a problem